In this video, I'm going to be discussing our chapter 11, or the theories of covalent bonding. And so I'm going to preempt the rest of this video with a word of advice and in addition to kind of a small warning. So this chapter is complicated. I am not trying to belittle this chapter or these concepts, but what I can tell you is many, many, many students, at least 75% of you, are going to way overthink these concepts. And so these horrible ideas and concepts, and again, I'm going to be start talking about like wave functions and everything else, but you can actually simplify the, all of these ideas by just keeping in mind all you really need to do is count, and not even to an extreme number, count to six and you should be fine. And so even though all these concepts are very difficult, and again, they're exploring some crazy ideas, you just need to count. And I'll go through and explain what I mean by that, but please do not let all these complicated ideas and concepts boggle your mind so you can't answer these simple questions. And again, I say simple questions by the fact I mean you just have to count in order to figure them out. So let's start off by talking about valence bond theory. And so valence bond theory basically is the same exact ideas and concepts when we first started talking about these electronic configurations. And so when we first started talking about the electrons of an atom or an atomic orbital, we stated the fact that these electrons have to obey some certain rules. And again, they have to be filled into specific orbitals first, and they can't go into multiple orbitals if you don't have enough electrons. The same deal has to apply whenever you start making these atoms into molecules. And so the whole idea here is whenever you start forming these bonds, these covalent bonds form, or again, this overlap of these electron clouds form whenever you have a smashing or basically a melding of orbitals of separate atoms, and they create an overlap in which a pair of electrons can occupy. And again, one electron comes from atom A, the other electron comes from atom B, they smash their electron clouds into each other in the form of these orbitals, and they have this overlap in which electrons from both atoms can reside. And so this orbital, this over, sorry, this overlap can again only accommodate for two electrons and they must have the opposite spins. This is where you get your bonding pair to reside between these two atoms. So the extent of the overlap and therefore the strength of the bond depends on a couple different things. One, it depends on the orbital shape. Are you talking about an s orbital which is a sphere or are you talking about a p orbital which is going to be that weird little dumbbell shape in addition to that the direction in which these things are going to be bonding also gives a relative strength to them and so if you're having a head-on collision of these two orbitals we call that a sigma bond if you have a side-by-side -side collision of them which again i have diagrams to explain what i mean later on but then you're going to be creating a pi bond, which again, is not as strong as a sigma bond. And so when I talk about maximum overlap, I mean the fact that these orbitals are going to smash into each other in order to maximize their overlap and basically give these two electrons as much space as they can in order to like, exist in order to make this bond. And so in these cases, the closer you can get your electrons to each other's nuclei, the stronger the bond is going to be. And so an s orbital smashing into another s orbital, you really only have one option. A sphere smashing into a sphere, you have to have a head-on collision, and you end up getting, again, the overlap in between them. And so when you're dealing with circle and circle, you can only have one area in which they're going to overlap. But as I stated with the p orbitals, you have this orbital that is going from side to side, but you also have an orbital on the at z axis and one kind of going in and out of the screen on the y axis. And so in these cases, if you're going to create a maximum overlap, you're not going to combine the orbital that's going up and down with this, uh, with this s orbital hydrogen because it's not going to create a very nice overlap. And so in these cases, this head-on collision is always going to occur whenever you have a sideways orbital kind of like this with the s orbital. Very similar, if you have two, I guess, two two P's overlapping, you're going to have much more like an extreme overlap if you kind of combine the one that's sitting kind of like this and the one that's sitting kind of like this instead of mixing the Z's and the Y's. Those still are going to have some influence on bonding, 
But this is where, all right, that is later on that we'll talk about. So I don't want to hurt your brains too much right now. And so <clears throat> the next concept is where students really start freaking out. And so whenever I talk about hybridization, again, when we first started, started talking about all these orbitals, we said there are S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, and F orbitals. But when you start making bonds, these orbitals cannot really adapt to forming bonds. And so if you are going to make a bond, you can take your atomic orbitals and you form them into what they call hybrid orbitals. And it's really easy to do if you count. And so again, I know these are complicated concepts, but please do not let it hurt your brain too, too much. Because in all of these cases, I'll go through and explain what I'm talking about in terms of count. But the number of hybrid orbitals formed equals the number of atomic orbitals mixed. Meaning the fact that if you mix one S orbital and two P orbitals, you're going to end up with one plus two equals three hybrid orbitals. If you mix one S orbital and three P orbitals and two D orbitals, 1 plus 3 plus 2 equals 6. And so you're going to create 6 hybrid orbitals. And so in these situations, do not think any further than counting. And so the type of hybrid orbitals formed is dependent on the type of atomic orbitals mixed. And again, this is not too difficult to understand. If you mix an S orbital and a P orbital, you formed very appropriately named an sp hybrid orbital. If you mix an s orbital and three p orbitals, you end up creating sp3 hybrid orbitals. If you mix an s and three p's and two d's, you make an sp3 d2 hybrid orbital. And so again, the naming of them isn't too difficult. You just write down whichever ones you combine. The number of them isn't too difficult. You count the numbers of things you're smashing together, and that will give you the number of hybrid orbitals you're going to create. And so the shape and the orientation of these is going to be, I guess, situated so that you maximize the overlap, meaning the fact you have to use the appropriate P orbitals in order to hybridize with the S orbitals, so on and so forth. So let's actually start talking about these hybrid orbitals first hybrid orbital that we come across is the sp hybrid orbital. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, you end up with an sp hybrid orbitals whenever you mix 1s and 1p. And so in this case, you have to remember 1 plus 1 equals 2. And so if you mix 1s orbital and 1p orbital, you create two hybrid orbitals. And because we're mixing an S orbital and a P orbital, we create two SP hybrid orbitals. And that is the extent of what you need to understand. And so if we need to bond with two things, we are going to create two spots for those things to bond using an S orbital and a P orbital, which is two. That's all you need to know. And so put this into picture form. If we have an S orbital and we mix it with a P orbital, we create two SP hybrid orbitals. Do not be too concerned about the shapes. That's not really the big deal. What you need to understand is that because we are creating two hybrid orbitals around a central atom, as we explored in chapter 10, the easiest way for things, two things to separate themselves is over 180 degrees. And so if you take a look at this, and again, nucleus is where your atom is. And so in this case, if you have two things, in this case the things are just hybrid orbitals, but if you have two things separating here, you are looking at a linear relationship. And so this 180 degrees happens because there are two things trying to separate from each other. Remember, these still have, again, some electrons sitting in them. They're just one electron instead of a pair now. So the whole idea can kind of be seen a little bit easier using these orbital diagrams. And so if we talk about beryllium, if you look on the periodic table, beryllium has two electrons. And so in this case, the electronic configuration of beryllium is 2s2, and then that's it. And so unfortunately, if beryllium wants to bond, as you can kind of see here on this diagram, there's two electrons in this 2s. 
So beryllium technically has no chance of bonding if it kind of stays in that form. And again, this is when beryllium is an isolated atom all by itself before it bonds. But beryllium really wants to bond. And so the way it can do that is it looks over here, and again, remember that N equals 2 is a package deal. So even if you're not using these two P's, as long as you have this 2S, those two P's are somewhere in the background. They're just not filled up. And so because of that, beryllium sees the fact that it has two electrons that it needs to split up. Because it wants to make some bonds, the only way you can do that is if you have a single electron in which another atom can kind of donate into that area. And so because it has two electrons and needs to split up, it come, goes over here and sees, hey, I have a 2P I can use. And so here it takes these two electrons and takes one of the electrons, throws it in there, and again, mixing an S and a P, or one box and another box, gives you two boxes. And because we're using an S orbital and a P orbital, we create two SP hybrid orbitals. In this case, because they're both the same energy, we can put an arrow up and an arrow up without violating Hun's rule, off bows rule, or Pauli's exclusion principle, or anything. But if it stayed in this format, one, again, can't bond no empty spaces. Two, it can't promote an electron up here because that's a whole lot of energy that has to do. But if it kind of reorientates things, now you have two orbitals that are going to, again, be at the same energy, and so you're not going to violate any laws. In addition to that, now beryllium has a space right here for a down arrow can come in, and another space right here for a down arrow to come in. And so in this instance, we have something very similar to this illustration right here. And so, the filled 2s orbital and one of the 2p orbitals of beryllium mixed to form two half-filled sp hybrid orbitals. Again, all that stuff was just kind of shown in the previous slide. And so in this case, the sp hybrid orbitals are going to separate themselves 180 degrees. But one thing I kind of left off from, from that previous slide, because I was going to bring it up here, is you still have those 2p orbitals. And so remember, you always get a package of three, that p orbitals always come in threes. And so just because you're using just one of those p orbitals for the hybridization, those other two empty ones still exist. And so in this case, they're empty, but they're still there. They're still available for something to happen if need be. As soon as you have this kind of set up, now we have available from some surrounding atoms like chlorine. And so, yes, I do understand chlorine is going to be 2S, or sorry, S2P5. But what I'm trying to illustrate here is just that one electron that's by itself in that one, like last P orbital. And so in this case, that one unpaired electron in chlorine, and again, that one unpaired electron in the SP orbital of beryllium, have some kind of attraction to one another. They can say, hey, we can form a bond if only we had some type of overlap. So in this case, you have a head-on collision here, and now you have an overlap of these orbitals. And because now there's an overlap of orbitals, they have an area in which they can share their electrons, and this is what you get whenever you create a bond. And so in these cases, again, you have sp hybrid orbitals from your beryllium, and you have a p orbital from your chlorine, both of those have a single electron. And on this slide, I also want to kind of note, chlorine is not going to make a hybrid orbital. Most of your surrounding atoms, especially if they're like uh, halogens, they already have a space available and it's in already in the P. It's the same energy as all the other electrons in the P orbital. It's not going to waste the time and energy to kind of make this hybrid orbital. And so surrounding atoms typically don't make hybrid orbitals just because they usually don't need to. They already have the space available for this to happen. So, the next one is if we have one S orbital and two P orbitals. And so again, just to put your minds at ease, one plus two equals three. And so if we mix one S orbital and two P orbitals, we end up with three SP2 hybrid orbitals. In this situation, if we have something like boron, we have something like P or the 2S2, 2P1. But again, if you have this set up, you can only make one bond technically because there's only one space in for this electron to come in. But if this element or atom wants to make more than one bond, then again, one bond's boring. Hydrogen's kind of stuck in that path. That's all it can really do. Lithium as well. 
But whenever you kind of look at atoms that have availability in order to access these additional p orbitals, it says, hey, I have one, two, three electrons here, but right now I only technically have one bonding electron. But if I can take this orbital that's completely filled up, this orbital that's halfway filled up, and this empty one, and smash them all together, you are taking one, two, three boxes and making three sp2 hybrid orbitals that are all going to be at the same energy level, so therefore they can occupy one up arrow each, therefore opening up three spots that you can kind of come in with some other arrow to like bond with. So please note, as I stated with the sp hybrid orbitals, you still have this p orbital here that's empty. It's unhybridized, it's empty, but it is still there. And so a good example for this, as I kind of stated earlier, is boron. <clears throat> and so in boron, you have three sp2 hybrid orbitals that are orientating themselves 120 degrees around. And so again, the reason they do this is because any atom that's going to come bonding with them has electrons, and they're still trying to separate all those electrons out as much as possible. And those pairs of electrons in those hybrid orbitals want to be as far away from each other as possible. And so if you take a look at boron and the way that it's shaped here, you'll notice that those sp2 hybrid orbitals are 120 degrees away from each other. You'll also notice that because that boron has sp2 hybrid orbitals, and because they're spread out 120 degrees away from each other, three things are surrounding boron. And whenever three things are surrounding a central atom at 120 degrees from each other, we are looking at a trigonal planar ge or electron geometry. And because all three of those things are atoms, we're looking at a trigonal planar molecular geometry as well. And so knowing the hybridization will give you a general sense of the electronic configuration as well. And so in these cases, you need to understand how these all kind of go backwards and forwards and kind of intercorrelate with one another. And so the next one we have with these p orbitals is if we have one more electron that we can kind of spread out, we can actually now take all of our 2s and all of our 2ps and put them all together in order to create four sp3 hybrid orbitals. In this case, again, if you had carbon the way it exists as an atom, it looks like it could only potentially create two bonds. By that I mean you have only one arrow, one arrow, so technically you can only have two atoms come in to donate electrons or overlap with electrons to make bonds. But carbon realizes, hey, there's an empty space over here. Why don't we just expand our whole horizon? And so this case, again, one of your two S's, three of your two P's come together to create four sp3 hybrid orbitals. And now in this case, you can have one, two, three, four spaces in or, or for other atoms to come in and bond. And so carbon will always have sp3 hybrid orbitals when it is surrounded by four things. And if you look at this diagram I have of CH4, you notice those four things are separated from each other at 109.5 degrees. And so that carbon is also surrounded by four things. And so again, four things because you used four like uh, atomic orbitals, and four things also means tetrahedral electron group geometry. And so if you can count to four, you know everything you really need to know about this whole geometry as well as the electrons. Again, in order to kind of make things a little bit easier, if you kind of go back through and take a look at the previous slides, SP3, how many letters are there in S and 3Ps? There's four letters. And so again, a couple different ways to go about this, but I have to remind you, do not freak out about all of this like crazy concepts. Just breathe and count. And so, next one we have to talk about is a little bit kind of disturbing just because I've kind of gotten you in this whole group. And so if you take a look at the periodic table real quick before I go to this next slide, you realize the next guy on the periodic table next to carbon is going to be nitrogen. And so following along with what I've been kind of doing so far, a lot of you are going to really, really want to be in the habit of just finding a fifth box to fill in here. But the problem with nitrogen and oxygen as well is it is sitting in group two. 
mean the fact it only has access to this 2s and those three 2ps. And because of that, it only has these four spaces available. And so when you kind of go through and draw out these orbital diagrams for nitrogen, you realize, again, you have these two spaces right there are already filled up. And in these cases, you have each one of these boxes has already one electron in it. And so regardless of how you arrange these and how you kind of go about it, you're only going to be able to have space for three atoms to kind of come in and bond. But whenever you make these four sp3 hybrid orbitals the same way we did with carbon, you have one, two, three, four, five electrons that you have to pretty much kind of shove into four spaces. And this is why whenever you look at this, this sp3 hybrid orbital that has an up arrow and a down arrow is basically stating this already has two electrons in it. And so this right here is corresponding to this guy right here that has two electrons already in it, or we call that a lone pair. And so each one of the other sp3 hybrid orbitals have still or still have space available for bonding, but it's just this fact that we have a lone pair in there because there's not enough space to separate all the electrons up. And as I mentioned, some of you are going to just kind of go crazy and see five electrons and want to split it up and make sp3 d hybrid orbitals. But again, you can't do that because d orbitals do not exist for nitrogen. It just doesn't even have them yet because we're still sitting at 2s and 2p. And so you don't have d orbitals until you get into the third or until n equals 3. And again, very similar to this is oxygen. When we look at oxygen, you have the same kind of deal. You have only access to your 2s and your 2ps. And so when you make your 4sp3 hybrid orbitals, two of those orbitals or two of those boxes are already completely filled up. And so this is why nitrogen and oxygen typically have those lone pairs sitting on them and why nitrogen typically only makes three bonds and why oxygen typically only makes two bonds. But one more thing I want to cover real quick is if you are looking at sp3 hybrid orbitals, you are looking at tetrahedral electron group geometry. If you're looking at sp3 hybrid orbitals in which one of those things is a lone pair and three of those things are atoms, you're still looking at an electron group of tetrahedral. But now we're looking at a molecular shape of trigonal pyramidal. Or again, if two of those things are lone pairs and two of those things are atoms, you're still looking at a tetrahedral electron group geometry. But the molecular shape of water is going to be bent. And so the sp3 hybridization tells you the electron group geometry. It doesn't really specify where those lone pairs are going to be. So you need to make sure to either draw it out in the orbital diagram or actually draw out the structure as we've done in the past. And so now that we have sp3 covered, the next guy we have to talk about is when we actually do have access to our d orbitals. And so something like phosphorus, here again we have S or 3s2 3p3. In this case, it can or it can make three bonds, but phosphorus is kind of stingy. You want to make five, and so here you take your one 3s, your three 3ps, and one of your 3ds, or one, two, three, four, five, in order to make five s3. So sp3 d hybrid orbitals. So in this case, still note that all of these unhybridized d orbitals still exist. They're just empty, and so they're not going to be kind of moving along with it. But as I covered in the previous slides, you need to have access to your d orbitals in order to make more than four bonds. And so here, if you kind of take a look at this one, you have phosphorus with one, two, three, four, five things surrounding it. And so you're looking at the trigonal bipyramidal electron group geometry. And now one last one we have, and again, it stops here because we ran out of shapes. In this case, if we look at sulfur, sulfur has the capability of making up to six bonds because it can access two of its 3D orbitals. And so one 3S, three 3Ps, and two 3Ds, or six sp 3 d 2 hybrid orbitals. And again, count six things surrounding it. You need to have six letters, and so you need one S, three P's, and two D's. 
And so hopefully right now you're starting to feel a little bit better about how these things are kind of like or come about. And so I do have a, uh, a slide in the slides that I post on Blackboard. It actually has a table on there that helps you kind of narrow down what I'm talking about in all these cases. But the main idea here is, oh, I forgot to mention, this is the octahedral geometry. But if you know the hybridization, or if you know the electron group geometry, or if you know where the lone bond pairs are, or if you know anything, you pretty much can kind of figure out all the other surrounding details if you are pretty certain that you know, again, either the hybridization or the orbitals or something else along or that goes along with it. For example, I want you to use partial orbital diagrams and describe how the atomic orbitals of the central atoms leads to how this guy is actually shaped. And so if we talk about methanol, here you can realize that we have two central atoms. We have a carbon central atom and an oxygen central atom. In this case, your carbon has one, two, three hydrogens and one oxygen, or it is surrounded by four things. Your oxygen is attached to a carbon and a hydrogen in addition to having two lone pairs, and so again, surrounded by four things. And stuff surrounded by four things is going to be a tetrahedral electron group geometry. And so again, knowing that it's tetrahedral should kind of give you a hint about where we're heading here. And so if we look at just the carbon, and so if we look at carbon, we know that carbon has an electron or electronic configuration of 2s2, 2p2. And so if we were to draw this in our orbital diagrams, we have two arrows in our 2s, and then two arrows in two of our 2ps. But as I've stated numerous times, carbon loves to make four bonds and nothing more or less. And so in order to do that, it's going to take one of, or it's one and only 2s orbital, and it's going to take two of its 2p hybrid, or sorry, uh, all three of its 2p orbitals in order to create four sp3 hybrid orbitals. And as you can kind of see, we have one, two, three, four arrows, and so we need to split up one, two, three, four arrows. Hence why carbon loves to make four bonds. On that same note, we have oxygen. So oxygen has the electronic configuration of 2s2, 2p4. But please note, oxygen does not have access to its d orbitals. So don't try drawing them in. They don't exist. And so here we have our like, orbital diagram showing you that every single one of these boxes is filled up with arrows. But if we still want to make some bonding as a central atom, we still have to make hybrid orbitals. And so therefore, they're all going to be the same energy but we only have four boxes to make these spaces, or four boxes to fill in. And so we make your 2s2 and your 3 2ps, and we're going to make it sp3 hybrid orbitals. We still have to basically try to split up your six electrons into these four spaces. And because of that, you're going to have these lone pairs, or you're going to have non-bonding areas, because they're already filled up, there's no space available for another atom to kind of come in. So hopefully the bonding in the sp3 hybrid orbitals makes a little bit of sense, especially when it comes to oxygen and nitrogen. But because please, if not, go back and take or go back in my slides as well in the video and just make sure that you understand that these sp hybrid orbitals they only exist when you have no other options. And so, or not even other options. You cannot make d orbitals if they don't exist. So, as I kind of stated numerous times in my chapter 10 video, is single bonds and double bonds are hugely miscon like I guess mistreated because we draw them as a single line and they like two lines. But as I kind of tried to cover and try to point out, a double bond is not two single bonds. And so a double bond is actually consistent of a sigma bond and a pi bond. And so a sigma bond occurs whenever you have, like, or I kind of like illustrated, a head-on collision of these overlaps. And so if you have an S and an S overlap, or if you have an S orbital with a sideways P orbital and they overlap, you have a sigma bond, or sigma bond occur in that. But a pi bond is formed whenever you have a sideways overlap, or in which case you have both of the p orbitals that are on the y-axis smashed into each other, 
or both of the p orbitals that are on the z axis <clears throat> kind of come close and overlap. And so I cannot stress this enough. A double bond is consists of a sigma bond and a pi bond. A double bond is not two single bonds. A sigma bond is a single bond. But a double bond consists of a sigma bond and a double bond. And so we kind of go through and talk about these one more time just to illustrate it. If we look at ethane. And so ethane is composed of all single bonds. And so both of these central carbons are surrounded by three hydrogens and then the other carbon. And so we know that we're looking at tetrahedral electron group geometry, but we also know because there's four things, we're looking at sp3 hybrid orbitals. And so when we kind of draw out these orbitals, we are looking at tetrahedral electron group geometry around both of the carbons, as well as a sigma bond between this sp3 hybrid orbital and this sp3 hybrid orbital for the carbons, as well as between this sp3 hybrid orbital of the carbon and the s orbital of the hydrogen. And that's the same for all these cases. But in here, you just need to understand that the carbon is sp3 hybridized to everything. And because of that, we're going to be looking at tetrahedral electron group geometry around both of these carbons. We're going to be looking at sp3 hybridization, and because of that, we are looking at a head-on collision or a sigma bond between the two carbons. And so the last thing we had, sorry, I already kind of mentioned that part. And so the next thing we have to talk about is what happens if we have a double bond instead. And so in ethylene, we're looking at carbon with a double bond between, or sorry, C2H4 with a double bond between the two carbons. And so in this instance, you have to remember that a double bond is still a single thing. And so your C or central carbons are both going to be surrounded by three things. And because of that, we know we're looking at a trigonal planar geometry around both of them, electron group geometry. And so one other thing you have to remember, and I tried to kind of point out earlier, is because you're making sp2 hybridized or hybrid orbitals, you still have an empty and unhybridized p orbital sitting on top here, well, top and bottom. And so remember, three things means you're going to have three letters, an S and two P's in order to get three letters. In this case, you are using only two of your three P's. And because of that, you still have a p orbital that is open and available for doing something. And so that something is where these pi bonds come into play. And so here again, your sp2 hybrid orbital of carbon and this sp2 hybrid orbital carbon can smash into each other to give you a sigma bond. But whenever we start talking about this 2p, and whenever I say 2p orbital, please understand it's this whole portion below and above the like, carbon. But what happens is these 2p orbitals, they kind of notice the fact that the like molecule it has some extra electrons that can't hold on to all its variable or all its spaces. So there's two p orbitals, they want to be involved, and so they just get a little bit bigger head. And then they actually get a little bit bigger, and this is where I say your sideways overlap. And here, as soon as they overlap, and again, this is not how it actually happens, but it's the way that we can picture it to make a little bit more sense, is they actually kind of meld and become a completely whole pi bond. And so in these cases, again, one thing I have to point out, and it's been big red letters here, but you have to have an empty and unhybridized p orbital in order for you to create a pi bond. And so the pi bond is formed whenever you have this p or empty p orbital on this carbon and this empty p orbital on this carbon kind of overlap in order to make a basically a hamburger bun surrounding your molecule. And so in this case, again, you need to point out this whole portion right there and that whole portion right there is still considered a single pi bond. In addition to that, a single pi bond still only holds two electrons. And so that double bond, or those four electrons, come about from the fact that this carbon and that carbon have a sigma bond between them using the sp2 hybrid orbitals. This carbon and that carbon also have a pi bond that comes about from this 2p and that 2p kind of overlapping. And so this pi bond holds two electrons. 
that sigma bond or that overlap holds two electrons and so this double bond has a total of four electrons. But again, when we talk about specific electrons, there are two sigma electrons and two pi electrons. And so please do not mix those up. And last but not least, if we have a triple bond. And so something like acetylene, each of your central carbons is now only surrounded by two things. And so because of that, we know we are looking at a linear electron group geometry as well as sp hybrid orbitals. And so if we draw out the orbitals, you'll notice again, we are looking at an sp hybrid orbital, meaning we only use a single p of orbital, and we technically have two other orbitals that we haven't even touched. And so as we kind of covered in that last slide, if you have p orbitals that can potentially overlap, you have the capabilities of creating pi bonds. And so this p orbital, the black p orbital going up and down, that p orbital up and down, are going to get a little bit bigger head, and they're going to start melding as well. And then again, the red p orbitals in and out of the screen here are going to do the same thing, and you actually have the capabilities of creating two different pi bonds. And so a triple bond is composed of two pi bonds and a sigma bond, and again, both of the pi bonds hold two electrons. The sigma bond holds two electrons. Total, this triple bond contains six electrons. But remember, a single bond is a sigma bond. A double bond is a sigma bond and a pi bond. A triple bond is a sigma bond and two pi bonds. And so this next slide, you don't really have to understand the graphic as much, but I do kind of want to point out the fact that a double bond is less than twice as strong as a single bond. And the reason for that is because, as I just mentioned several times by now, a pi bond is composed of a sigma bond and a pi bond. And so a double bond is not two sigma bonds. A sigma bond is stronger. A sigma bond is a head-on collision. Think about like holding hands. But a pi bond is just whenever you're standing really, really close to somebody and so therefore you have kind of attraction there. And so in these cases, a pi bond is weaker. I'm not saying a double bond is weaker than a single bond. I'm saying a pi bond is weaker than a sigma bond. And so in these instances, technically, it should be like 1 and 1.8 and 2.73 for these bond orders. But in order to make our lives a little bit easier, we still talk about the number of shared electrons between the two. And so if we kind of go through and start talking about another example here, like acetone. And so if we draw out the, the Lewis structure of this bad boy, you see that there are three central carbons, and outside carbons have three hydrogens. That central carbon has a double bond to the oxygen there. And so the main idea here is if I want you to describe the orbitals and what kind of bonding situations we're looking at, you need to not only pay attention to the surrounding atoms, but where these lone pairs are, where these double bonds are, where everything else can kind of influence how these things are going to bond. And so if we take a look at these outer two carbons right here, and again, doing very simple adding, or not even adding, counting, count how many things are surrounding them. Here we have one carbon, we have one, two, three hydrogen, or four things. If you have four things surrounding your central atom, you have to be looking at sp3 hybrid orbitals. If you look at sp3 hybrid orbitals, you're looking at the tetrahedral electron group geometry. And so if we look at this central carbon again, remembering that a double bond is still just a thing, then you can see that this central carbon has three things surrounding that central or surrounding the central atom. And so this one again, we'll be looking at sp2 hybrid orbitals, and we're going to be looking at trigonal planar electron group geometry. And last but not least, even though it doesn't have any other partner surrounding it, this oxygen still has some electronic geometry because those lone pairs exist. And so for this one, we still have a, a, a single group in that double bond. We have a single group for each of those lone pairs, or we have three things surrounding it, or we're looking at another sp2 hybrid orbitals. And so this next slide, I really love this image just because it's really kind of crazy looking and throws you off. And so when we talk about how these things are bonding, those carbons that I have highlighted in blue, they're just these carbons right here, this carbon with the three hydrogens. 
And so these two carbons, again, they're sp3 hybrid orbitals. There's four of them. And so here you're looking at sp3 hybrid orbital of carbon mixing with the s orbital of hydrogen. And this head-on collision is going to be a sigma bond. Same deal with these guys over here. Very similarly, when we kind of look at the carbon, the central central carbon, you're going to be looking at Sorry, my daughter was trying to break into the house again, or into the door. And so the central carbon is sp2 hybrid orbitals. And so in this case, that central carbon is going to be having sp2 hybrid orbital merge with this carbon's sp3 hybrid orbital, have an overlap, again, head-on collision, so we're looking at sigma bond. In addition to that, this carbon's sp2 hybrid orbital is going to merge with this oxygen's sp2 hybrid orbital with a head-on collision in order to create another sigma bond. And so everything that I have drawn here is going back to this slide, this previous slide here, of a single bond, a single bond, a single bond, a single bond. All these single bonds are sigma bonds or these overlaps of the sigma bonds. And so this next image over here, just kind of imagine that you are taking your molecule and you're like you're looking at your hand directly and then you twist your hand so that you're now just looking at your thumb. That's all I mean by rotating 90 degrees. And so in this instance, because your carbon, your central central carbon, and this oxygen, they made sp2s. This made sp2. You have three p's. They come as a package deal. So because of that, this p or this carbon here, imagine it's coming in and out of the screen, actually has a p orbital that's unhybridized. This oxygen, same deal, has an empty and unhybridized p orbital coming in and out of the screen. And so whenever you kind of flip this sideways, that's what this is showing is that the oxygen's empty p orbital and the carbon's empty p orbital kind of again overlapped and now you're looking at a pi bond. And so in this case your double bond is composed of this sigma bond between carbon and oxygen using the sp2 hybrid orbitals and this pi bond that's created from the carbon and oxygen's empty unhybridized p orbitals. And so now they have a better idea of these pi bonds. I just kind of want to illustrate now this is why these double bonds kind of restrict rotation. If you now kind of treat this as like a hamburger bun situation, you can't really flip your patty whenever you shoved it into your hamburger bun. And so that's why, again, seeing C2, H2, Cl2 doesn't really kind of give you all the information you need. But the cis and the trans here is telling you that the chlorines are on the same side, the hydrogens are on the same side of that double bond. Whereas, again, trans, it's telling you that the hydrogens are across from each other and the chlorines are across from each other. And so this next topic, again, this is where I want to kind of, I guess, take a break and warn you all again. These molecular orbital diagrams and the molecular orbital theory is something that even whenever we do lectures like face-to-face, -face, I have a lot of students kind of just start blanking out by this time. And so it is going to be on the ACS. I'm most likely going to leave these questions off of the actual exam. And so you do need to understand it for the actual material, for the final exam, for everything. But for now, even if it's on the exam, like exam four, it's going to be very watered down. And so please understand that I get these topics are crazy. I mean, hell, we're talking about wave functions right now. And if you don't know what a wave function is, don't look it up because you're going to just hate chemistry all like in general if you do. But the main idea here is I want to I want you to understand this is all theoretical. Meaning the fact there is really no way to add a wave or subtract a wave. But the main idea that you need to get across here is that these uh, just come about because if you have atoms, the atoms have to merge their electrons. They have to rearrange their electrons in order to become molecules. And so whenever I say things about adding atomic orbitals and subtracting atomic orbitals, just kind of take it for a grain of salt and just kind of go along with the material. You're going to be okay, I promise. So, bonding molecular orbitals. This whole idea just means the fact that you're going to have an overlap in which your electrons are going to be able to reside and you can create a bond. And so this is, again, sigma bond or pi bonds. 
And when we make bonds, as we kind of explored in previous chapters, that's a good thing. It lowers the energy. It makes everything else nice and more unstable. On the other side, you can create anti-bonds as well. And the easiest way that I can kind of describe this is matter and antimatter. And so the whole idea, again, it's all theoretical, but again, if you are able to make a bond, you have to have the equal opportunity of not making a bond. And so all I'm really trying to show you in this diagram here is if you have a hydrogen atom, and again, nucleus, hydrogen atom, nucleus, you have one electron cruising around somewhere in there. And so you have a chance of adding these two guys together in order to create H2 in which you have two electrons residing in this overlap of this orbital. I'm sorry, of the molecular orbital. Well, or if you take this hydrogen and this hydrogen, you can actually potentially create an antibond in which you create a space between them in which there is never, ever, ever going to be a bond. And so that's all I really mean by the fact of bonding and antibonding. But if you kind of remember the fact that bonding is a good thing, it lowers energy. But if you bond and create an anti-bond, it's actually a bad thing. It goes up in energy. We prefer not to do that. And so this is why typically, again, we kind of just take a look at these things. Bonding, good. Anti-bonding, bad. And so one thing I have to point out before I move any further. All of this stuff is done just to figure out if your molecule is going to exist or not. All you do for these molecular orbital diagrams is fill in electrons and then you can say, hey, it has a bond order of 1, it exists. Or if it has a bond order of 0, it doesn't exist. That's the only reason you need to worry about all of this stuff. And so luckily for us, though, we already know many of the rules that kind of govern how to fill these things up. And so molecular orbital diagrams show the relative energy of these things, of all the electrons in each molecular orbital. Luckily for us, it is set up very, very, very similar to atomic orbitals. And you remember atomic orbitals, 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, so on and so forth. And so once you fill these things up, you can calculate the bond order is equal to half of the electrons, and again, half parenthesis, of the electrons in bonding molecular orbitals minus the number of electrons in anti-bonding molecular orbitals. And so in general, and again, just as like following the trends from the previous chapters, if you have a half bond order, it's going to be weaker than a single bond, than a double bond, than a triple bond, or bond orders of one, two, and three. And if you have a bond order of zero, it means that that is probably never, ever, ever going to exist. And so when we kind of look at a molecular orbital diagram, and again, in a few seconds, I'll describe where all these arrows and everything are coming from. But basically, it has kind of two separate pieces. On the outer edges here, you're going to be looking at the atomic orbitals of whatever atom you're referring to. On this other side, you're going to be talking about the atomic orbital, orbital of the other atom. For now, we're just going to be dealing with diatomics. And so your atomic orbitals on both sides are going to be the same. And again, you know how to solve these. The atomic or the electronic configuration of hydrogen is 1s1. And so why you have a 1s box and it has one electron in it. And so here you have one hydrogen bringing one electron. Here you have one hydrogen bringing one electron. And so in this case, you have an equal opportunity of mixing this s orbital and that s orbital and creating a sigma bond and a sigma bond or like star bond or bonding and anti-bonding sigma. And so here, whenever you add your one electron plus your one electron, again, as I mentioned, it's all coming down to counting, you have two electrons. And so that means that this atomic orbital plus this atomic orbital can only give you two electrons to put into your molecular orbital. And so everything on the left-hand side belongs to this hydrogen. Everything on the right-hand side belongs to this hydrogen. Everything in the center belongs to the molecular uh, model of H2. And so that's all you really need to remember is you know these. We've done these many, many, many times. Once you know your atomic orbitals, count all the electrons and then fill them into the center. And that is the extent of molecular orbital diagrams. And once you know that, you just have to count. There are two electrons in my sigma. There are zero electrons in my sigma star. 
are two bonding electrons and zero anti-bonding electrons. And so the bond order would be half of two minus zero or a bond order of one. Meaning the fact that H2 is going to have a single bond between those two hydrogens. And so filling in these electrons again, it's going to be very familiar because you have done all of this before. Electrons are placed into molecular orbital diagrams the exact same fashion by the same rules as the atomic orbitals. And so by that I mean you have to fill them in in increasing order. You have to only have two electrons per orbital and you have to fill them in at least half filled before you start doubling up on them. Or you have to follow Hun's rule, you have to follow Aufbau's rule, and you have to follow the exclusion principle. Same exact concept we kind of dealt with in the past. And so instead of this being 1s2, 2s2, now they have different configurations of sigma 1s2, but same exact relationships still apply. And so if we take a look at helium, and so helium is 1s2. And so here you have one atom of helium with its atomic orbital of 1s2. You have another completely separate atomic orbital from our completely separate helium of 1s2. Because you have an s orbital being combined with an s orbital, you know you have the possibilities of creating a sigma bond and a sigma star bond. Or a bonding bond, bonding bond, a bonding area or an anti-bonding area. And so here, just count. If you have one, two electrons from this helium and one, two electrons from this helium, that means you have four electrons total that you can put into this middle region of helium two. And so here, if we put in two electrons here, we still have two more electrons. And so we have to go and put them into the higher, electro or higher energy level. And so we look at the bond order of this, you'll notice that half of two minus two is going to give you zero. And so this is basically illustrating that there is no such thing as helium two. It will never exist because it will always have a bond order of zero or basically no bond. And so if we do the same kind of deal, but instead of having two heliums, we have a helium and a helium plus. And so for this one, please notice helium plus has one electron missing because that's where the plus came from. And so we kind of go through and look at this. We now have the same options. We can create our sigma and a sigma star. But whenever we have our three electrons rather than four, we can still put two electrons in the bottom and fill it up completely before we move up. But for this next one, we only really have one electron that we can put in there. And so now the bond order is going to be half of your two bonding minus one anti-bonding, or a bond order of half. And so this is to illustrate the fact that HG2+, plus, it doesn't exist. But if we were to try to force it, it may exist for like half of a millisecond. But as soon as somebody sneezes, then again, your half of a bond is going to fall apart pretty readily. But again, just wanted to illustrate, this is the main reason why we do these molecular orbitals, is just to figure out a bond order or just to see if it exists, like these ones right here. And so Li2, it tells you that you have a bond order of one, meaning the fact that there is a way for lithium to bond to another lithium. But if we look at beryllium and count up the number of electrons, you end up with half of two minus two, and so now you're looking at a bond order of zero, stating the fact that this never will exist. There's never going to be a way to form these bonds. And so, this next slide, as I've kind of done in the past, I'm going to try to prepare you ahead of time. This stuff starts getting crazy. When we start talking about S's and S's, there's only one way to smash those S orbitals together. They're spheres. It's just like taking two balls of Play-Doh and smashing them into each other. But whenever we have p orbitals, things get a little bit crazy. And the reason for that is because p orbitals have three different orientations that we can choose from. And so we can have the two, and I have to make another video at some point, so keep an eye out for it, of showing you what I talk about. But if you take both of your fists and smash them head on to each other, you can kind of think about that as your two f orbitals that are laying onto their sides. And because of that, that is going to be a sigma bond that is going to be created from those two orbitals. But if you talk about the two orbitals that are kind of standing up and down, if you smash those into each other, that is a sideways overlap, and so that is going to be classified as a pi bond. 
Additionally, if you take the other pi orbitals that are going in and out of your screen, we are talking about, again, a sideways overlap, so that's another pi bond. And so when we kind of look at these, and again, this is what I mean by your fist smashing forward, but these sideways ones, they can only have a headwise overlap, and so this is going to be a sigma. And so if they are added to each other, we can create our sigma bond, but again, if they're subtracted, you create a sigma star bond. But additionally, you have the other two p orbitals. You have the p orbital standing up and down like this, but again, you have the p z from what they have like labeled here. That's kind of going in and out of the screen. Because they're sideways overlap, these are pi bonds. So please notice it is a pi there instead of a sigma. But because you have two of these, you, each one of your pi orbitals can potentially create one sigma bond and two pi bonds. Because again, there's three different orientations. You have to have three potential areas in which they can bond. And so when we kind of go through and look at this, each one of these <coughs> p orbitals that you mix will actually have uh, four different locations. And so take a deep breath, press the pause button, go grab a drink because this next slide is going to give you a headache. And so whenever you're back, push play. All right. So whenever we talk about these molecular orbital energy diagrams, one thing I'm going to tell you right now is we will give you these structures. Even the ACS exam will give you these structures. You just need to know how to fill them out. But the problem is, is there's two structures. And so right now, I would suggest you not even worrying about or pay attention to that without 2s2p and that with 2s2p mixing. It's just telling you why there are two structures. And so the only thing that you need to worry about is assign the correct structure with the correct elements. You only need to know about oxygen, fluorine, neon, and boron, carbon, and nitrogen. And so if you are talking about the diatomic molecule of O2 or O2 plus or O2 2 minus, you're going to be looking at this structure right here. But if you're talking about carbon 2 2 plus, then you're going to be looking at this structure right here. And so I know they look very similar, so in order to highlight the difference, here are some arrows for you. And so the whole idea here is between oxygen, fluorine, and neon, which notice on the periodic table, those are the later three in a period two. But if it's in one of these three, you are going to, again, fill them in, sigma, then sigma star, and this center, or the B region, looks kind of symmetrical. And what I mean by that is you fill in the sigma, then the two, two Bs, or sigma, two, two pi's, and then you're going to do the pi star, then the sigma star. Or again, it's symmetrical along this axis right here, where you have sigma, pi, pi, sigma. But on the other end, when you're looking at either uh, boron or carbon or nitrogen, you're going to fill in sigma, then sigma star, and then you're going to fill in the pi before the sigma. And again, it seems goofy and weird, and if you want to look up why, then go for it. But I don't have time, nor do you want to hear about it if you're one of those who doesn't want to like care about it. But the main idea here is that you need to understand, if you're dealing with boron or carbon or nitrogen, you need to fill in these pi's before you fill in the sigmas. And the rest of it goes back to the same order. Or another way to look at this, using this diagram right here. And so for the last three, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, you fill it in for what I call symmetrical, where again, you're filling in sigma, then sigma star, then sigma, then pi, then pi star, then sigma star. But if you're dealing with the previous three in like the group two, then you're going to fill in your sigma, then your sigma star, and then flip the two. You're going to fill in your pi, then your sigma, then your pi star, and then your sigma star. And so in these cases, you just need to know these three go with this filling order. These three go with the other filling order. And besides that, you're just going to have to count some things out. I'll try to find a few examples to make a, a few, or future, videos, or future videos on. But for now, again, do a couple of these practice. Look it up on Blackboard, not Blackboard, on Google. And we'll wait for those other videos to come out. And unfortunately and fortunately, that, that's all I got. 
And so I'm not doing the quirky big voice, but hopefully that kind of helped you out more than just sitting at home and reading through the book. Good luck.